What is the number one thing holding you back from everything you want in your life? It's fear. Often misunderstood and misdirected. Today we are talking about the energy of fear, how you can use it, how you can slash it, and how you can use it in your life to fuel you forward. Hi, we're sisters Kay and Shy, and we're the hosts of the Infinite Energy Podcast. We believe that everyone has the power to live a more energized, optimistic, and fulfilling life. In every episode, we share tips and techniques for harnessing your own power and creating the life you deserve. Get ready to ignite and discover the limitless power of Infinite Infinite Energy. Energy. Don't be afraid. Today, we are talking all about fear. The energy of fear. Most of us try and shy away from it as much as possible, and for good reason, too. But for lots of us, it ends up dominating our life and our thoughts way more than we'd like. Fear can hold us back, but it's actually an uh, emotion that's given to us as a mechanism to help keep us safe. Uh, We are animals in a natural world, which means that our biology is designed in order to get us to not die, right? The point is to live for as long as you can. And so a healthy dosage of fear is something that we're given as biological beings in order to keep us safe. So we're not down with fear? No, we are not. No, you put that fist down. Okay. (laughs) But what we are up for is understanding fear's role in our life and how to make it our friend, our mentor, our co-founder, our oft quoted here, dear friend, Joseph McClendon III often says, there are no fearless people in the world, but there are people who fear less. And so we know we can't totally assassinate fear, but how do we use it and then get out of it as quick as possible? That's what we want to talk about here today. Well, the emperor is way less intimidating when he hath no clothes. So let's undress fear a little bit and talk about what it is and what it does for us because fear has purpose in our life. Now we mentioned the first one and that is survival instinct. It helps humans recognize and respond to threats in their environment and allows us to take necessary actions in order to protect ourselves. A healthy dose of fear is a good thing. It keeps you safe, especially in danger situations. But if we're trying to figure out, like, let's all get on this same page here. When we're talking about the definition of fear, I think it's time for our, maybe is this a scary definition of the day? It is a scary definition. Indeed, the definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. So a belief of danger, pain, or threat. Now, when we really, when we really bring the, break that down, we realize there's lots of places where we're letting fear expand in our lives that isn't really presenting danger or threat in our lives. So, it, right, it is, it is the fact that your food is taking 10 minutes longer really a danger to your life. And you might say, well, that's, that's, you know, that's an angry emotion. That's not fear. Well, when we really look at the vast emotional complexion that is humanity, there are two sides and that is fear and love, the positive and the negative. So any emotion that we would deem as negative or dark is going to be classified under that master umbrella of fear. But the good news is you can channel it, you can use it, and we'll talk about that. But understanding that that's that state that we're in and that it's a fear state means that we have opportunity to use it and to grow from it. Fear being on that same chord, that same vibration on the opposite spectrum of love is another garment off this emperor that we're just going to go ahead and take off for a minute. Let's make him less intimidating. Fear is used for emotional processing and emotional engagement from a social standpoint. Fear of rejection, fear of failure helps us to be more prudent when it comes to decision making. Now, if we had zero fear, we would move forward without any abandon or maybe no consideration for other people or for their feelings. And so that fear is can be a, pro- a product of love, right? This idea of wanting love in our lives also gives us the fear of being rejected for the want 
of that love. The other thing that fear does for us, okay, let's take the garment off together, is learning and conditioning, right? Think about the first time that you ever fell on your bike, right? You fell and it hurt really bad, right? Maybe you skinned your knee, but chances were right before you fell, you did something different than what you normally do on the bike. Maybe you went over a hump or you tried to go around a corner too fast and the bike skidded out from underneath you. Now, what happened happened as a result of that was pain. Now, the next time that you go to go around a corner extra fast and you feel the bike start tipping in that way, the healthy dose of fear will kick in. And guess what? That's learning and conditioning taking place. And so we're ungarmenting the emperor, helping you hopefully see that fear isn't necessarily a villain. It's not the antithesis of what we want. It's not the antithesis of love. It is a, it is a contrast in order to help bring about the things that we do want. And when we realize that, we realize that fear can be productive. And you probably have some different places where you even recognize this in your lives, right? Like, let's talk about the night before a test, right? You're fearing about the grade. You're feeling anxious about the test coming up. And so in order to alleviate that feeling, what do you do? You go study, right? You prepare for the test, which alleviates your fear, makes you feel better, and then gets you to do better on the test. Now, what most of our brains do is then go on, well, now I need to feel fear in order to make myself do the study in order to then get to it. And so now we have this building of fear and this habit of fear that might not be productive in the long term. But when we realize that there's that power, hopefully then this is how we become that we fear less as soon as we feel that that we move into action and we allow ourselves to alleviate the pain right away to us uh, to relieve the fear and to take the action that allows us to get the result that we want and so in this way fear is very productive for us because it's an indicator that yeah, we need to take action or we need to take caution and both of those things are very helpful for surviving and thriving in this world when we don't take action or caution as a result of fear and allow it to fester inside of us, it can lash out in some incredibly uh, difficult ways for us to handle. Many people find fear manifested as things like extreme anxiety or even fear manifested into extreme anger. Imagine a fear of rejection so deep that you fear making connection at all or a fear of losing someone so much that your anger toward them when they when they have feedback for you begins to uh, demonstrate maybe the opposite of that feeling you have inside. And so fear when it gets clung to, fear when it gets focused on can manifest in some of the darkest of our human emotions. Well, energy is a, or I'm sorry, fear is a very powerful energy. And, and so its indicator to you, its spark inside is so that you can use that spark to initiate into that action or to take caution and, and maybe observe and, and reassess what it is that you need to do. But that's still taking an action, right? And, and so that's that spark of fear. It's very, very powerful. But as Kay mentioned, if you do not do the action or caution or some way to channel all that spark of energy, energy can't sit still. So it festers and it festers and it builds. And what do sparks do? They create fires inside. You don't want an emotional fire. You want to use that spark to your advantage and channel it in a way that's productive for you. At least that's what I want to do. I don't want internal fires and we all ablaze them, right? Like this is a, uh, uh, some people live in fire. Some people vacation in fire. Some people only visit occasionally. We all get fires from time to time from that spark of fear. But the best of us do our best to try and use that spark and channel it as fast as possible. Now, fear is such an effective influencer that it actually gets utilized by popular media, by advertisers, by governments in order to influence people into certain ways of thinking. There's literally a term for it. It's called fear mongering. You've likely seen this. It doesn't seem like as time goes on, headlines are getting more dramatic, like it, like not even even just the ones on the crazy, like the globe or like whatever, the like one on the stand that says Oprah's an alien, right? Not those ones, but like the regular headlines are starting to get more and more dramatic. And why? It's because fear sells. It's because fear gets people to look at it. When someone is afraid, it's straight. It stokes one of those strongest emotions. It is an incredibly influential emotion. And so what it gets from you is you to click 
on a link and hopefully go to a website, which then makes that newspaper or that entity money. And so this idea that fear is used as an influence, maybe on you or at you, hopefully helps display its influence in a way that you can utilize it and harness it, like Shyla said, for those better things in your life, right? There are other people pointing gas at your spark of fear and wanting to light it ablaze because it, it is beneficial for their eventual outcomes, which is your attention and your ad money to converting into sales. And so we want you to just be aware of how fear is being used as an influencer uh, when it comes to those marketing pieces. And we also want you to be aware of what we have to share with you in the next segment. So make sure you stay tuned as we continue to unpack and unclothe the emperor of fear. Do you find yourself losing control of your scroll on social media? If you do, then you want to stay tuned to join the Simply Social Club with Kay and I. We've got an awesome challenge for you where you have the opportunity to detox from social media for 48 hours, seven days, 14, or even 31 days right along Shyla and I. So go to kandshy.com slash simply social and find out a little bit more. And hopefully you'll take a pledge alongside us. We'll see you in 2023. See you in the club. One of our proudest business accomplishments is what we've been able to do with Squeeze In Franchising. The Squeeze In is a breakfast lunch restaurant featuring the best omelets on the planet, and it's been around for almost 50 years. And now you can have a Squeeze In in your community. We've seen how this business transformed our families, and now we are so excited to offer this to families around the country to see how this little restaurant might change their family and their community. If you're wondering how to set up your adult children for legacy and success through a small business, then the Squeeze In is an option we urge you to consider. Come find out more about Squeeze In Franchising at squeezein.com. You're enjoying this episode on Angel Phoenix Productions Podcast Network. To explore a complete lineup of quality programs and media production services, head on over to angelphoenix.com or like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash angel phoenix productions. Now, as we were just sharing, fear is very profitable for marketers and advertisers to use. And and this has been well studied and well researched in the book Influence by Robert Cialdini. He talks about the fact that the, the two main emotions that can influence folks to make decisions through advertising are fear and curiosity. Now, fear is a lot easier to spark and stoke than curiosity is. And so it's no wonder that advertisers move into that fear place and that culturally culturally we move into that place when we want to motivate or influence others, right? Think about the expression FOMO, fear of missing out. We're literally stoking people's fears. It has a label, it has a name, and we're using it in that intentional way because it influences folks. So being aware of that influence from external sources, it, it pales in comparison to the influence of your internal source of fear, which is where we want to help you because this is the fear you can control. And then we, we, we share the earlier piece with you so that you can guard your mind against the rest. Now, fear, as we mentioned before, when it goes unchecked, can manifest in emotions that aren't necessarily un- are comfortable or are emotions that we want to feel. And so uh, we have five what we like to call shades of fear that we want to share with you because these are fear in disguise emotions. So let's go ahead and unclothe that emperor. Let's let's make him less scary, less intimidating here because fear can show up in ways that we don't expect. And sometimes it's running rampant in our life without us even realizing it is until we identify it. So the first shade of fear we want to present to you is the shade of hopelessness. Uh, We all visit this place as well from time to time, this shade of fear. Some spend more time there than others, but that hopelessness is that place where you feel like there's nothing left for me 
What is the point of trying? There's no hope, right? And we ho- hope is that first thing that we can grab onto that shifts us out of out of that that big fear zone. But hopelessness is that place where I don't even have a shred that I can hold on to. I feel like hope is one of those things that when we are hopeless, maybe it's sneaky and you might not realize that you are here. Hopelessness is one of the ultimate states of unresourcefulness. If you tune into our podcast about the energy of resourcefulness, this is the opposite of that. This is the space of unresourcefulness when I feel like there's nothing for to be done, right? There, there is nothing that I could possibly do. What even is the hope? What is the hope, right? But, but we've heard it said in life that hope is a human superpower, that the option and the choice of hope is one of the things that makes our very species unique from those other species here in the natural world. And so when we can give ourselves the opportunity to shift from hopeless into hopeful, we give ourselves the gift of becoming our own seed planter. We put the seeds into our own farmer's bag and we start to walk along our fertile soil and plant those seeds up of hope. And so we do this with those infamous quest, infamous questions. If you've been here with us in this podcast before, you know, we've talked about some questions that you can mantra to yourself to help you move from unresourceful, undesirable states into ones that are more beneficial for you. Now, our favorite question to move from hopeless to hopeful is what can I do? This was that number one activator for resourcefulness as an emotion. And it's the number one activator to get that first strength of hope, right? Because from there, you can pull yourself up and out and into resourceful emotion. So what can I do allows you to shift away from that spiral of, right? Hopelessness also sounds like I'll fail anyways. I always do. Or everybody's already doing all kinds of different things and there's nothing that I can do. So that that's also a state of hopelessness. And so asking what can I do allows you to grab some shreds of hope and move in the direction of being more resourced and resourceful. Now, the second shade of fear that we want to talk about here is another really sneaky one that you might not even realize you're engaging in. We say this from a place of love because we have been the people who have engaged in this particular shade without really understanding that it was at play. And until we make that unconscious conscious, it will simply continue to rule us. And this is the shade of fear called judgment. If you are the type of person that is better at seeing the things that are wrong instead of the things that are right, you might be participating in this shade of fear. And this is not a resourceful or helpful shade of fear, right? Our whole point is to pull ourselves out of it as fast as possible. There are no fearless people, but there are people who fear less. So how do we get to fear less? Well, first we identify where we are. And if we realize that we're being judgmental, that means that we're being critical and it means that we're narrowing our point of view and our options in front of us. So we want to recognize that as fast as possible. So if you find yourself saying things like they will think this, right? It's not only about the judgments you're putting on others. It's about your expectation of the judgments you think they'll put on you. Often that is the the shade of fear that kills our dreams the fastest, right? And we're, we're so worried and afraid about how others will judge us or they'll think this or they'll say that or he'll say this or so-and-so will think that. Like, and what way? It's none of your business, right? What they think. But more importantly, that is not a helpful state to be in. And so you want to snap out of judgment as fast as possible and move into a grateful state. Because when you start asking yourself, what am I grateful for? Okay, when you start focusing on things that are adding to your life in a positive way, this allows you to get to grab that thread out of this unresourced state and get up into a loving emotion that's empowering as fast as possible. When we put the our own thoughts into the minds and hearts of other people. We are judging uh, them in ourselves, right? This is a very easy trap to fall into. And it's done. This is often a, a fear action without us realizing, right? We're judging because we, we find some form of inadequacy within ourselves because you are the one who knows you the best, which means you know all of your flaws better than anybody else does, which means you judge you the worst. And, and th- we know that because we judge us the worst. Worst <laughs> out of all, right? And so this is just fear being manifest, fear of those social factors.
factors, fear of rejection, fear of people not liking you, fear of putting yourself out there, right? The judgment unchecked is really just fear in disguise. And so let's take that clothing piece off the emperor and let's move into the question that we can use when it comes to eradicating the fear of unchecked manifested as judgment, right? In order to shift from judgment to gratitude, it's that question, what do I like? right? What do I like? Because that allows you to shift out of judgment both on yourself and on others and move up into helpful states that allow you to get out of that fear and into the place where you can make some creative choices, pick some of that fruit off of the creative tree, but you can't even reach up to the branches when you are low in the fear pit below it. And so you've got to get yourself up into at least a neutral place. And in fact, gratitude is one of those emotions that we often feel can be one of the easiest bridges, right? Because it's sometimes it's hard to go from like really angry and upset to like joy. <laughs> that, that can be tough, but gratitude can be a bridge because you can force your, your brain to get there by asking, what do I like? Because when you answer that question, it's going to evoke feelings of gratitude inside of you because you're grateful for the things that you do like and you give yourself a chance to cultivate gratitude when you ask questions like, what do I like? Okay, let's get to our next disguised fear emotion that is likely a whole Holding you back. And this is the state of entitlement. Oh, okay. Okay. I already feel your bristling. We already feel your bristling. You're saying I'm not entitled. That's not me. Okay. We get it. We're not calling you entitled, but hang with us for just a second because sometimes we slip into entitlement without us even realizing what is happening. Now, entitlement can all, can be this feeling of, I, I already know that, right? Or I know what's possible that what, what I, what you're saying, saying isn't possible or it should be this way, right? No, it just should be like that. Or there's just no way I've tried everything. This shouldn't be so hard, right? This is the land of shoulds, right? The, the, the idea that you know best, because if you are in the judgment seat saying it should be this way and it should be that way, then you've entitled yourself to the place of knowing what's best for maybe beyond just yourself. Right. Entitlement is really what, when we're talking about this emotion, that's that state of expectations not being met right? It's that, that what you want isn't happening and you're not happy about it. And you want to try to grab onto that and you want to try and control it in a way that's not healthy for you. So this is that land of should, right? Because anytime you are saying things shouldn't or should be some way, you're saying, I have an expectation that's not being met. And that is a priority for now, everyone around me. And that is not resourced or helpful when we are in that state of things should or shouldn't. We, we could also maybe even call this attachment, right? This is that attached to how things are going to be, need to be in order for me to be happy, to be relaxed, to be peaceful, to be grateful, to be helpful to people, right? If we feel entitled or that our expectations are being violated in, in a way that's not matching what we think needs to be the outcome, this is an opportunity for us to get in a more resourceful state, to activate into some love and give ourselves the choice choice of being more creative in our approach rather than narrowing down into entitlement, crossing our arms of this energy and saying, well, it shouldn't be like that. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about what happens when you let leave entitlement go completely unchecked. We're talking leadership this week, and one of the organizations we are so proud to be at the helm of is the Neuroencoding Institute. We got to co-found the Neuroencoding Institute alongside Dr. Joseph McClendon III, amazing, world-renowned neuropsychologist and incredible mentor and teacher. If you're at all interested in learning more about what the Neuroencoding Institute does and what it can do for you, please visit neuroencoding.com. You're enjoying this episode on Angel Phoenix Productions Podcast Network. To explore a complete lineup of quality programs and media production services, head on over to angelphoenix.com or like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Angel Phoenix Productions.
entitlement unchecked can be a very dangerous emotion. Entitlement unchecked turns into something that called indignation. Now, this is another scary definition of the day. So let's hear it. Indignation is anger or annoyance provoked by what is perceived as unfair treatment, right? So when your should expectation doesn't get met, it's anger or annoyance that is provoked as a result of that expectation not being met. And so indignation often ends up turning into you treating other people poorly. And ultimately, we know that's not what anybody wants. Right. Uh, This uh, epitome of this is that Karen, right? Somebody who's throwing a major fit in a restaurant or in a service space um, and yelling loudly and demanding things uh, that are that are ridiculous. Right. That's that level of indignation. They are so attached to what their definition of how things should be going is that they are willing to behave and act in a way that is to most of us absolutely atrocious, right? And so it's easy to be in judgment junction as we look at it as an extreme example like that. But I absolutely know that personally, I experience this when my kids don't act the way that I expect them to, right? And I might get a little indignant at them for not knowing something or being a certain way. And so again, all of us visit these emotions emotions from time to time. It's how quickly can you pull yourself out of them? And if you want to pull yourself out of this emotion of entitlement or indignation, then what we want to do is invoke the emotion of humility, of, of, of giving it up to the greater good of what is happening, of almost that energy of surrender. And so in order to do that, we use the question, what's the truth? Well, think about the action of of giving something up. We're not talking about giving up, period. What we're saying is giving up the expectation that something should be one way or should be another. Because when we hold those things to the point of indignation, the only person we end up causing pain really ends up being ourselves, or at least we cause ourselves the most pain of all. And so this idea of what's the truth helps us to center around maybe not what our idea of what is right, but what is what are the facts? What are the, what is the truth of the situation that's happening right now? Let's take this from a, a restaurant example, right? Now, people seem to get very indignant with uh, us in the restaurants when their food takes longer than they should expect. Now, generally, food in a restaurant takes about 15 to 20 minutes to come out. And so there is an expectation that it should take about that time. Now, if it takes 25 or 30 minutes, we might find a guest feeling indignant. Now, I would understand that feeling and be empathetic toward that. But if a guest were maybe to look around at the restaurant during a 30 minute food wait and ask themselves the question of what's the truth, they might see that the restaurant's totally overwhelmed and it looks like they're a little bit understaffed today. It looks like maybe that food is coming out into the window right now and that there are facts at play beyond my expectation that may be helpful in calming my level of indignation. Right. And then asking yourself continuously in that mantra form, what's the truth also allows you to perhaps if you're that guest say, what's the truth? The truth is I don't have an appointment after this. And ultimately five minutes isn't going to hurt me anyways. Or what's the truth? I really need to get out of here. And I've got to, I've got to get, I've got to let the server know that I might have to cancel my order and have them box it up. So now at least we're taking action that helps us achieve what we want versus stewing in our frustration. And look, we've all been there, even us, right? Like sometimes you're at a restaurant and they are just drowning and in the weeds and you're feeling for them, but you're starving. And it's been like 45 minutes and you're like trying to be your best, but you're getting squeezed by that and you're hungry. Like we've all been there. But if you continue to ask, well, what's the truth? Like the truth is I'm not going to die. The truth is we'll be fine in the long run. The truth is I bet the server could really use a table where she lands and they aren't angry at her. And so you are able to weather it even when you're not necessarily enjoying it. Even if you don't weather a situation like that, 
that, right? The, the truth is, is that you also have the power to joyfully and lovingly take yourself out of a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable. You have the power to get up and go eat somewhere else if you're really that hungry and hopefully not take your indignation out on the people in front of you, but make empowered choices. Now let's get into our final two shades of fear today. The questions you can ask to get yourself out of them and how we can turn it around. Now the next one is the fear shade of insecurity. All right, truth talk, raise your hand if you've ever been insecure. Hello, how about earlier today? Come on, baby. This is a very, very common shade of fear that many of us uh, experience often, daily, hourly, even minute by minute. And this is why we like to call getting stuck in the land of don't, don't, don't. Oh, it's an echo chamber, isn't it? It is, right? Because this is where we get stuck saying all the things we don't want. Insecurity is all about focusing on those things that you don't want, right? I don't want to be unhealthy. I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to lose my job. I, uh, I'm insecure about it, right? I don't feel that sense of security about things. And so, because you might have heard insecure and go, I'm fine with the way I look. Like we're talking insecurity on every level. Do you feel fully secure, planted, firm, and confident in every area of your life. Because if you don't, welcome to being a human. Glad you're admitting that to yourself. And right, we, we all have places where we feel a little bit insecure, a little unstable in different places. So it's not about never visiting these places, it's about recognizing it and getting out of it. But the, right, this sounds like that. I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to outlive my children. I don't want something bad to happen. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to be alone. If you've ever had that pattern running in your head, you've had this feeling of insecurity. So how do we move and shift from insecurity security to security. What is the question that allows us to get out of that thinking pattern the fastest? And that is the question, what do I want, right? Because you've been in this echo chamber of don't, don't, don't. <laughs> so you have to say, do, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? And you force your brain to focus, come out of that echo chamber and start answering that question. Because when you do that, it allows you to really activate into that place where you can make more happen. When I was pregnant with my son, Thomas, I had an overwhelming insecurity and fear around losing him in utero. I was so nervous about him dying. And, and I kept saying to Shyla, I just, I don't want to outlive my kids. It's, it's, we, you know, it, it's one of our examples. I don't want to outlive my children. I just don't want to outlive my kids. And this fear was really pervasive. I mean, really pervasive. So sometimes to the point where I, we would be off on an adventure and it would be 10 o'clock at night and we'd be away from our kids. And I would look over to Shyla and I'd say, my kids aren't going to die. Right. And she'd be like, that's really morbid. You don't need to be thinking about that right now. What's going on. Right. And so I was stuck in this valley of what I don't want. I don't want to outlive my children. And so the shift that I've made is that I want my my children to outlive me, right? I want them to outlive me. And so when I start to feel the dark insecurity of the wound of all of the women that have lost their children in this life start to creep into my soul and my heart and steal my presence and steal my joy in the now moment, I use this question of what do I want in order to help steer me into a more constructive way of thinking. And, and that future, that imagined future is one that makes me feel a lot more warm and fuzzy inside than the opposite. What I love about the way you do that, Kay, is you always also make that shift while holding reverence for those who have, right? And just the space for those that have experienced those kinds of traumas and tragedies, because it is part of the human experience. I mean, from one spectrum to the other, right? Like we're, we are all going to die. And so knowing that we're all affected and impacted by that reverence for that space while allowing your brain not to stay stuck in that echo chamber is one of our favorite tricks in, to getting from insecurity to security, but we've got one more, one more shade of fear. And this is the shade of apathy. I don't want to do it. <laughs> Ever been there? Raise your hand if you've been apathetic. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh man. Every Sunday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is hard, man. I don't want to. I'm just not motivated. What's the point? I never follow through. It doesn't work for me. I don't deserve it. I don't feel like it. I'm just not motivated, right? Apathy. Many, many people call this laziness. And then sometimes people are like, I am lazy and you own it. Like it's this really awesome thing. But we think that that's pathetic. No 
nope, we think it's apathetic. That is apathy. And it's really just another shade of fear. So we want to shift apathy into action as fast as possible. And uh, the question you can ask yourself to most easily do that is what energizes me. Imagine that here you are listening to the Infinite Energy Podcast. And one of our top questions for you is what energizes me? Because when you ask that question, your brain is forced to come up with the answer. So if we're apathetic and we're on the couch and we're melted there and we don't want to get up and do the dishes, right? Like what energizes me? Like, well, what you right at first, you're probably sassing yourself. Like, well, what energizes me is being rested here on the couch, right? Mm-hmm. Like what energizes me? Like, well, what energizes me is going into the week prepared. What energizes me? What energizes me is when I wake up knowing that I've got everything good to go. Well, what energizes me? What energizes me is that feeling when I'm done with the freaking dishes and I'm just going to get up and do it. So what energizes me allows you to go from that apathy into action if you keep asking yourself and maybe it doesn't give you the exact action that you needed, but moving yourself into any action is more constructive than apathy and non-action. Now, if any of this has been helpful for you or you've enjoyed the ride here on the Energy of Fear today here on the Infinite Energy, podcast. We invite you to subscribe, follow along, leave us a review. We would really appreciate uh, hit that five star button for us and let us know what you think about your sisters, because we do this every single week with love from your girls, Kay Kay and Shai. This podcast was a production of Angel Phoenix Productions. Explore more episodes of this show or other great shows on the Angel Phoenix Podcast Network by visiting angelphoenix.com. The views expressed in this show do not necessarily represent those of Angel Phoenix Productions or its advertisers and may contain language that's unsuitable for younger listeners.